Time for everyone involved, I'd like to get going now and introduce the first speaker, who is Richard Thompson, who has a bachelor's and master's degree from Iowa State University. He is a farmer, farming about 10 miles due west of Ames. And for the first uh, 10 years, he was a farmer in what we consider the standard uh, conventional method. Uh, 12 years ago, he switched to organic farming. He has traveled around the country and has written many articles and given many speeches and talks on his alternative method to agriculture. So without any further to do, Mr. Thompson. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a privilege to be here, but I like to do things in uh, the right order. So I, I would like to introduce my wife and partner first, if she would stand, that we are in agreement on the organics. <laughs> Being in the backyard of Iowa State University, uh, feeling sort of all alone, it's nice to have a, a partner that feels the same way. Why didn't you bring her up here? Scott brought me. <laughs> <laughs> I got her close. If we could have the lights out, and we'll see if we can. Uh... Uh, traveled widely and spoken uh, in many places on various aspects uh, of uh, economics and farm technology. He um, received an undergraduate degree from Creighton University and an advanced degree in economics from the University of Denver. Uh, I want to introduce Mr. Charles Walters. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here, especially when I see some old friends here like Phil Allen. I remember him sewing that loaf of bread. Matter of fact, he provided me with a picture and I ran it on the front page and caught a little static myself. I remember, you know, Phil, some years ago we cut a tape, a videotape, in which we'd given uh, Heydrich Houdecker uh, the literal hell. He was one of the Council of Economic Advisors. You recall that? One of our great brethren has passed over the other day. Ar Arthur Oakham passed away at the age of 51. Uh, Arthur Oakham was supposed to have been a very brilliant economist, and perhaps he was, but he sure didn't know much about nutrition. I think Phil learned quite a bit about it, and he finally went of a heart attack. In any case, I'll start with a little confession. I'm not a farmer, and I'm not even a professor, and I'm not an expert. And the truth of the matter is, I don't have all those answers that uh, you've been working at, because I don't even have the questions. Actually, I'm just a reporter, and everything I say to you has to be credited to somebody else somewhere along the line because very little of it is anything that I counted for myself. And I'm biased. I always have viewed an unbiased person as one who is suffering from the delusion of the simple-minded. Or maybe it was the banner of the opportunist or the boast of the dishonest. And having said that much, I have to proceed with the usual prayer that we start our publication with. If I could paraphrase St. Paul, O oh Lord, please help us so that in giving counsel to others, we might not ourselves become castaways. In many of these publications, I've pointed out that environmentally sound agriculture, bioagriculture, organic farming, these things are not playthings for amateurs. I've watched many a person try to make a mo move over to this new form of farming. And they've had problems. And still, the whole thing seems to be gathering speed and moving ahead. Why do these people fail, the ones that do? I think in many cases they fail because they have unrealistic expectations. 
and they have some rather unreal counsel, and perhaps they're relying too much on some folklore. More often than not, when these people fail, they go into a holding pattern pending the arrival of better tools with which to make the transition. Because I don't think the idea is dying, even for the ones it isn't working for. So I think we all need to get back to some kindergarten basics before we move ahead. So I'd like to quote for you a passage one of my writers and associates, Gene Perot, often uses. He goes something like this. Long before man could make a plow or a test tube, nature was creating life, including man, and providing an environment in which that life could flourish. Now she used the resources of air, water, sunshine, and earth minerals to make this life. Now she, if she had only created life, the resources would all have been tied up rather quickly. So she created the greatest invention of all, death, so that the resources could be recycled again and again. And there's a basic law in biological agriculture that says all life forms must return at death what they took from the resources of the earth during their lifetime. In biological agriculture, no less than in any other form of agriculture that's now being practiced, we are not exempt from the laws of life and death. Now, we know about the empire building and soil destroying instrument known as the moldboard plow. And I think you all know your history well enough to know of the faltering farm production that caused farmers to seek virgin land out west. As a matter of fact, that was the initial scientific advice from USDA. Go west, young man, go west. New land would replace the worn out land in a big, big country. And then came the day when the land was gone and the crops faltered again. And there was a Dr. Whitney and a Dr. Cameron out of USDA. They advanced the idea that these low yields that we were experiencing across the country were due to the effects of excretia left by the previous crop. Science said that if corn followed corn and more corn followed more corn, there would be a poisoning effect that took hold. And by that time, the scientists had really arrived, and the research plots revealed that rotation would sustain and improve crop production. And yet some people today will argue that rotation is fine, but it's really going broke on the installment plan. You've got to do a little bit better, because after a while, the crops began to falter again. And I'm sure Mr. Thompson's neighbors rotate, don't they? Corn and beans, there you heard it. In the meantime, those who read Nature, not just books, pointed out that the Blue Stem Prairie out in Kansas had followed Blue Stem Prairie, not 10, 20, but thousands of years without poisoning the soil. And in some countries of Europe, specific crops had followed specific crops for centuries. And so at the University of Illinois, Dr. Cyrus Hopkins and some other chemists proved that inorganic elements such as calcium and phosphates were necessary for abundant growth. They found that symbiotic bacteria lived on the roots of these legumes and clover, beans and alfalfa. They could take nitrogen from the air. And when this was discovered, the scientific era guided by chemical analysis was off and running. But a a great cloud had descended over the countryside by then. There was a hot, dry cycle afloat, a depression, and there were dust storms in the west. And when I was a youngster, the Soil Erosion Service came into being. It was later called the Soil Conservation Service. And almost overnight, restoration of nutrients became public policy. Lime to the neutral point became the general advice. You can't overdo it. And as a consequence, half the country was over-limed because it needed no lime at all. And many of the smarter farmers just kept some acid soil in a barrel. And when they needed a liming payment, they sent in the, send in the appropriate soil sample. 
But a dangerous fiction became established that pH 7 was ideal. Yet pH 7 was little more than an insurance policy for selling farmers on what Dr. William A. Albrecht called that damn fool idea of water-soluble, factory-acidulated salt fertilizers. Because you see, a non-acid soil cannot tap its own nutrients from the rock, even if it has them. The salt fertilizers constitute imbalanced nutrition. This has been the basic premise that we've used ever since we started Acres USA. An imbalanced nutrition brings on nature's disposal crew. And that's the reason that the NPK fertilizers in untrained hands become an insurance policy for the sale of chemicals of organic synthesis. Nevertheless, the research plots proved that more bins and bushels could be grown with these fertilizers. And because of this, two false concepts swept the republics of learning, partial or imbalanced fertilization and toxic rescue chemistry. And now, if production didn't falter, then land did. And muddy wa waters ran from the fields. We compute that 160 acre farms topsoil is deposited in the Gulf of Mexico each and every day of a 365 day year. The soil has lost its tilth nationwide. And after 30 years of the most feverish dam building in history, we still have an experience, the most devastating Mississippi floods in history. And now a new menace has surfaced to endanger mankind. The science that picked up agriculture by its bootstraps has turned to hucksterism and no longer carries, cares about the biochemistry of immunity, which is seated in fertility management. A mistake is no longer a mistake, according to our land-grant colleges, this one included. If ever more powerful chemistry can intervene, as a consequence, degenerative metabolic disease has become the legacy of an entire nation. Substances that are teratogenic, which means we will deform the fetus, mutagenic, carcinogenic, they've become commonplace around and on the food supply. Now, eco-agriculture or biological agriculture stepped forward from the underworld known as the organic movement hardly a decade ago. Initially, it leaned on folklore, common sense, and a small measure of science. It appreciated the fact that farming depended on the welfare of the soil system and its chemical, biological, and physical balance. The tools that emerged from the literature of science, the extension that human ingenuity could account for, seemed dazzling in their purity. They served the needs of biotic life. They made available nutrients that imbalance had locked up. They were non-toxic. They were ecologically sound. And yet there was a big but. Some years ago, a man named Edward Faulkner wrote a book called Plowman's Folly. Endorsed by Lewis Bromfield, it received a great deal of attention because Malabar Farm at that time had become the mecca for the soup companies and uh, the aggregate business projects who were interested in preserving the nation's topsoil. And that's how the great plow debate got underway. The late Dr. William A. Albrecht at the University of Missouri didn't so much reject Faulkner's concept of tillage that mixed air, soil, water, and trash as it did the idea that there always were and always would be enough trace minerals, enough major nutrients, Therefore, the farmer had merely to let nature do the job. I'm afraid this is what some of our friends are saying, and they're embarrassing us. Use this and use that. Use this inoculant. Use this foo-foo dust. And you need never worry about phosphorus, potassium. Are we not preaching to others and ourselves becoming castaways? Oh, we have the records to prove our crop improvement story, our plots and our bins and bushels. 
But sometimes I wonder if we not too are becoming miners at times. There are acres that have a hundred years of supply of potassium. And it's to the credit of eco-agriculture that we know how to tap this resource rather than dump more on year after year. There are acres with great quantities of phosphorus, all of it, in, all, all of it unavailable. And the conventional advice continues to be to add some more each year so that 90% can be locked up and 10% can be purchased by the crop. Still, life forms must return at death what they took from the resources of the earth. So our technology, as well as any technology, has to be monitored in terms of the earth resources. There's no more land. At the yet at the recent Farm Progress show, I saw $120,000 machines designed by engineers and produced by factories sold through dealers. But soil restoration can't be made in a factory and brokered through a dealer. The job of biological agriculture has to be accomplished by the farmer on the land, just like Richard Thompson demonstrated to you. This requires principles more than it requires an ability to buy products and read labels. Now, over the years, I and my associates have stated these principles and hammered home the lessons for living with them. We've put them in issue after issue and bound them in hardcover books. And I'd like to really simply restate them for you here. One, simplistic nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NP and K, fertilization means malnutrition for plants, animals, and man because either a shortage or a marked imbalance of plant nutrients prevent balanced plant health and therefore animal and human health. Two, plants in touch with exchangeable soil nutrients needed to develop proper fertility loads, structure and stabilized, structure and stabilized internal hormone and enzyme potentials provide their own protection against insect bacterial and fungal attack. Insects and nature's predators are a disposal crew. They are summoned when they are needed, and they are repelled when they are not needed, all according to the laws of life and death. Now, weeds. Weeds are an index of the character of the soil. It is therefore a mistake to rely on herbicides to eradicate them since herbicides deal with the effect and not the cause. Crop losses in dry leather, weather or during, mar during mild cold snaps are not so much the result of drought and cold as nutrient deficiency brought on by poor soil structure incapable of serving up nutrients and taking in water for capillary return. Now get to number six. Toxic rescue chemistry hopes to salvage crop production that is not fit to live so that animals and man might eat it, always with consequences for present, future generations of plants, animals, and men. And seven, man-made molecules of toxic rescue chemistry do not exist in nature's blueprints for living organisms. Since they have no counterpart in nature, they will not likely break down biologically in a time frame suitable to the head of the biologic or the biotic pyramid, namely man. Carcinogenic, mutagenic, and teratogenic molecules of toxic rescue chemistry therefore have no real safe level and no practical tolerance level. These are the lessons we tried to hand out to people and amplify and explain month after month. And young people in the school sometimes come by. They do not seem to understand some of this simple and yet profound philosophy. And they turn to the professors and the farmers for answers. But most farmers and most professors do not understand either. They may still remember that nature created life, but they think the test tube 
and fossil fuel people have vacated nature's rhythm of life and death. And I think it boils down to this, and I think this is what we're talking about. What does a farmer do? In agribusiness, they say he produces pork or corn or wheat or milo and maybe gasohol. And they may be correct as far as that goes. But I see the final product of the farm as a human beings with minds capable of thought and reason. There's more to farming than bargaining with the trades for dollars according to some few economic laws. The farmers must also bargain with nature according to the laws of life and death. And that is what organic agriculture is all about. Appreciate your listening. Thank you, Mr. Walters. The, uh, the last speakers, uh, Scott and Helen Nearing, uh, well, it's very hard to summarize almost 100 years of work, and I don't, uh, uh, won't attempt to do it, other than point out that since 1932, uh, both of them have been living what they call the good life, partly in Vermont and now in Maine. But uh, if you want a, a summary, at least from one point of view, of what the 20th century has been like in the United States, then follow out the career of Scott Neary, because the first book that he ever published appeared in 1908. Uh, the first speaker of, the, of this twosome will be Helen Neary. The first two speakers went far on the road to farming. If theirs is a quiet protest, ours is a teeny little, a teeny protest, because we are not farmers at all. We're mere gardeners. We uh, don't go in for acreage. I was staggered at all the work that uh, you do, Richard Thompson, on your farm. We keep busy, but we have a quarter acre garden. And it feeds uh, five or six people, and that's, that's all we attempt. We don't go in for market gardening. We grow our own food and consume it. We cut our own wood, and we burn it. We uh, build our own buildings, and we live in them. We're not uh, in the market at all, and we don't house or feed or pet or exploit or eat animals. So uh, we're not in your class at all. We're really not large-scale farmers. We're little, teeny, um, alternative homesteaders. And um, I think that uh, what we are doing is something that some of the people here might tackle, whereas they could hardly tackle what uh, Richard Thompson has tackled. But if we're not in the market gardening, and if we're not in any way of getting money for our crops, what do we use for money? That's a question. We don't use much money. I go to a supermarket, I go to a store about twice a month, and I might buy a little salt, a little soap, a little, uh, toilet paper, a little, um, maybe some spices or so, some nuts and some citrus. All the rest of our food comes from the garden. And uh, fortunately, Scott was a gardener when I met him because I knew for nothing at all. I was a musician and had to keep my hands clean. Even now, although I don't play the violin as much, when I get up in the morning, I put on a pair of work gloves in order to keep what is left of my hands for music. I have a sister. She gets up in the morning, she puts on lipstick. I get up in the morning, and I put on work gloves. <laughs> Any of you who are old timers know Scott's reputation, good or bad, hap whether you're on the right or the left. He was. Uh, tossed out of his chosen profession 
as teaching from various colleges and universities, probably as many as each one individually has been in, he is out of. <laughs> and it was all on account of his uh, radical or idealistic views. All this is told in his autobiography, which is the, the Making of a Radical. And that very book was re refused by six publishers because it had the word radical in it. It's not a best-selling word. I was going to bring along copies of it for some of you, but I have a list of the books outside there. And if any of you want to read the book, you can get it from our home address. Scott was one of the first teachers discriminated against before McCarthy days. And so we were forced into homesteading. He had no money. I had no money. We had about $1,000 between us. We put it in on a $1,100 farm. It was 65 acres in southern Vermont in what was then called the wilderness section of Vermont. It is now the biggest ski industry section of Vermont, which is why we left it and emigrated to Maine. So we were forced there really by unemployment. I had never handled a hoe or an ax or a saw. I had never, uh, didn't know what part of a tree the sap came out of for maple syrup, but we were finally earning our living making maple syrup up there. This alternative way of living we found in the country, and for 50 years we've been doing it as a quiet protest and as a means of earning a living. What money we do have, we get from Social Security, being of that high age. Scott put some money into insurance when he was still in the university business, and any money we get from lectures or from royalty, and there's quite a lot of from royalty, we put into his political books, which no one will publish. And we get them out with that money. So the agricultural and political social background is this of our way of life, and it is a very un-American way of life. It differs from the American way of life in many ways, and one of the first although it's not the most important, it's the first that comes to mind with me, is that we have no TV, no radio, or no telephone. And that is stranger to our neighbors than uh, the way we eat or the way we live or the way we work. What? No television? You can come and look at ours, they say. <laughs> I did go and look at Nixon. Uh, Nixon uh, resigned. I wanted to see him out. So, <laughs> so I went to see him out, and uh, I happened to be at a friend's when the Olympics were on, and that was very nice to see. And my friend said, look, see all you can see with the television. Why don't you get one? Think of the news. You don't get very much news with television. You get some headlines and some personalities. We subscribe to endless uh, magazines and newspapers. So we have not copped out. We do know what's going on in the world. And we travel when and if and as we can. We have touch with many people through correspondence. And we're members still of Radical and other organizations. Scott Nearing has not copped out even though we have gone to the country and no longer live in the city. So we're homesteaders. That is, we live on the land in a different way than most market gardeners or farmers or most ordinary Americans. We're small-scale gardeners in that we grow our own food for our family consumption. We grow enough, we grow 85% of our food we feel on the place. Right at home now, there is a cellar full of potatoes and cabbages and carrots and beets and rutabagas and a lot of canned stuff so that come the revolution or um, war or something or other, I think we have enough food on the place, in the garden, in the greenhouse and in the cellar and in the pantry to get by at least for three or four months without ever going off the place. So we're self-sufficient in that. 
And then we're vegetarians. We have no cows, no horses, no chickens. So we don't have to watch over them. And we don't have to put land into production for them to eat off. We're uh, protesters against the use of animals for food. One. <laughs> Hail. We use no oil or gas for uh, cooking or heating. We burn wood. We're on the coast now. We're on uh, Penobscot Bay, and a lot of driftwood floats out, which is poor for burning, makes a lot of creosote. But uh, we burn that. We burn old trees, down trees, bent trees. Um, we cut all our own wood. And if Scott were not sitting at the table here now, he would be home sawing, cutting, splitting, and carting in wood for our two wood fires. It's an essential part of uh, self-sufficient homesteading to provide wood from the place. We've built all the buildings in which we live. And there is stone. In Vermont, we built a main house, a guest house, a study in the woods for Scott, a woodshed, a lumber shed, a greenhouse, a guest house, and, and the main house, and then a couple of sugar houses. So when we left those buildings, kissed them goodbye, we w moved to Maine and found an old sort of Swiss homestead on the coast. And we thought, well, we've, we've built of stone. Let's leave that. But we still itch to build of stone. And there's a lot of stone in Maine and a lot on the beach. So around our quarter acre garden, we put a 400 yard, 400 foot, what is it, Scott? 420 feet. 420 feet foot stone wall around our garden so that no weeds can get in. Once you clear the inside, the weeds don't come in, the slugs don't come in, the rabbits don't come in, the woodchucks don't come in, and you've had the fun of building a stone wall. <laughs> so that we did. And then we built a garage and a workshop and two greenhouses on the place in Maine. So that's part of our homesteading, to build our own buildings and to live in them. In a way, it's, it's the way the early settlers lived. And perhaps our greatest claim to fame, if such there be, is that we started it a long time ago, and we've kept at it a long time. I met Scott in about 28, just the years of the Depression. He didn't have a penny. I hardly had a penny. And uh, we started out then, got the place in Vermont for the $1,100. And we stayed together ever since. So it's uh, sort of unique, apparently, that we are in it, have been in it so long, and that we're so old and still doing it. Since then, in recent years, many, many, many young people have tried it. And I should say 90% of them seem to come up and see us about it and ask our advice and ask if they can't stay around and, uh, and help. Some of them do, and some of them, some of them are a help. Uh, <laughs> these young people don't fit into the mercantile society. They may not have been kicked out as Scott was kicked out, but they do not fit in. And most of them come from well-to-do bourgeois homes. We hardly have a proletarian kid come up, though they do, and they're no better or worse than the rest of them. But it's interesting that they have left home. They've had everything given to them by their parents. Their parents want them to have more than they ever had, and they flood them with things, and the children turn off to the woods and uh, come and see us, and then they find that there are plenty of problems. You can't just lie in a hammock and uh, live the good life. They protest, but they've got to learn to put some backing behind it. They have to learn skills, as uh, we had to learn. They must, as we did, build their own buildings, grow their own food, cut their own firewood, and uh, some of them make their own clothing. I'm not a sewer. I frequent thrift shops and rummage sales. I was at a meeting in Portland, Maine, when a man in the audience at the end of our talk on simple living said, I'm in the suit and dress business, and that suit you have on 
It's a $160 suit. What do you say to that, lady? And I said, gee, I'm glad to hear it. I got it for $3 at a rummage sale. <laughs> so so that's, that's uh, another way we can keep from using too much money. These young people, most importantly, must they must get hold of land. They must acquire land somewhere. And it isn't as cheap as when we bought it for three and four and five dollars an acre. They've got to pay something at least under a thousand dollars an acre, around a thousand an acre. Our old sugar bush in Vermont, which we bought for about three dollars an acre, is selling now for eight thousand an acre because it's right in the heart of the ski district. So these uh, young people who are trying to um, start out now in homesteading, the only way they could do really is to get together and buy a farm together, or a young couple to buy a good farm, or even a rundown farm as we did, is very, very difficult now at the present time. So um, protesting against tradition is not always very easy. Scott and I have been together at it for half a century. He's been at it for almost a century. When did you begin to be radical? Well, we'll go into that later. <laughs> we're, uh, we're thoroughly convinced in its uh, use, in its possibility, in its efficiency, its efficacy, in building up a way of life contra to the American way of life. And we're happy at it, and we'll continue it beyond the century mark if we live that long. The next speaker will be Scott Neri. Thank you, Helen, for making most of an essential speech. <laughs> there are only a few chinks that I can legitimately fill in. I looked with renewed amazement at the photographs of this farm in your state, <laughs> acres and acres and acres of fertile land. Not only fertile on the top, but really deep down fertile land. Being maintained by the use of very expensive, elaborate machinery and uh, very expensive chemicals and a tremendous amount of labor power in order to keep one family alive. Now, <clears throat> if this farm that we saw pictured were supporting, say, 250 or 300 people, 50 families. Then you would be talking like a Chinese or some other Asian who utilizes land minutely and carefully. We utilize land wholesale we spend enormous amounts of it, energy in farming it. And when we get through, their land won't raise a crop because its chemical balance has been upset by inexpert applications of nutritive elements. Helen has said that uh, we live on 
at the moment, 28 acres. We're getting a little older all the time and probably will soon reduce that amount to about four or five acres. In this last three quarters of a century, we have built two stone houses, a number of many other buildings, but most important of all, we have maintained ourselves chiefly by our own efforts and the efforts of addition of the additional efforts of a few friends and neighbors and helpers as the case might be. I have been around the world a great deal. I have seen intensive agriculture in Holland, in France, in China. I've seen intensive agriculture where a few acres support enormous numbers of people, support them in good health and fine spirits. And uh, this is something that we fail to do in the United States. Our population is not in fine spirits. It's spending billions a year on medicines, on doctor's bills, on uh, nursing homes, and all of the rest of the apparatus necessary for the preservation of a sick society. <laughs> I don't know anything about these things. <laughs> I'm only a doctor of philosophy and economics, sociology and history. But beginning in 1905, I have been making my own living with my own hands. I regret that I am in the Mississippi Valley. I ought to be home making the necessary preparations for the garden, which is beginning to mature as the, the ice and the snow melt and spring opens up. I have been working at this business, a little land and a living, as one author put it. I have been working at this business, making a little land furnish good health, serious interest in life, and sufficient leisure time to read and study and travel and do many of the other things that are incident after your living is supplied and guaranteed. When Helen and I <coughs> left New York City in 1931, the percentage of unemployment, I think, was around 14 percent. And the country was flat, 1920, 31. 29, 31. The country was flat on its back. We didn't have much money, and uh, we decided that we'd make a living by our own efforts, rather than live in the city on the dole or through some other means maintain our support on the labor of other people. Now, if you do that, then you have the over-machined, over-chemicalized, over-labor-supplied farm in Iowa or Georgia or some other part of the farming area of the country. If you turn to intelligently and uh, seriously and conscientiously, if you work at it, not only will you be able to maintain yourself without keeping the chemical industry and the machine tractor industry 
and the transportation industry, etc., etc., without maintaining this huge apparatus of unnecessary mechanism. <clears throat> but you will have time to live. And you will also be able to maintain reasonably good health. I'm 96. I've been around a long time. I've watched many people, many places, waste themselves, waste the land, and waste the earth to no purpose to no serious purpose, not maintaining health, spending money on disease by the billions. Well, that's, that's enough, I think. I, I, uh, I, I felt very glad that Helen made the talk that had to be made in our terms. Uh, she did it very well, and I endorse it uh, 99 and 9 tenths percent. <laughs> what I'm what I'm trying to say is that agriculture <clears throat> is basic to hope and help. And you must turn to the earth for the materials out of which life is maintained. But this is not the whole of life. This is only the fringe of life. After you have maintained good health, well-being, after you have preserved yourself as a functioning machine, then you go ahead and live in the, in the vast variety of areas in which the human being can function successfully, happily, usefully, productively, creatively. Agriculture in that sense is basic. If you're going to start out on a day, you begin by taking nourishment, and that nourishment carries you through the day. And then nourishment comes the next time. You may be a, a carpenter. You may be a doctor. You may be a school teacher. It doesn't make any difference what your function is. You need to be healthy and well. And hopefully, you need to be confident in yourself, confident in, in the future, and happy in a day's work well done. And you, instead of being uh, as foolish as the American people and retiring when you grow up, <laughs> instead of retiring when you grow up, grow up and carry out the day's work, carry out the year's work, carry out the service, provide the service that mankind must provide for itself and ought to provide also for the planet. That particular theme is the subject of my uh, talk, <coughs> my talk this evening, and I needn't stress it any more. I thank Helen for doing so nicely with self-sufficient homesteading. It's 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 a genius that ought to be stimulated and utilized. I thank Helen for doing a nice job, and I thank you for listening. For people in Iowa, where they waste machinery and labor and chemicals <laughs> wholesale. said he, dis he agreed with all I said except one ninety-ninth of one percent. 
I agreed with what he said except one ninety-ninth of one percent, and I'll get it in now. Seems to me as if he thought that this beautiful farm we saw up there was done with chemical fertilizers, did you? In which case, well, any ca in any case, you were wrong. Yes. What's that? Wasted. Wasted. No, well, there I disagree with you entirely. It was a beautiful farm, and it was organic, and uh, he didn't understand, and so I apologize for that. <laughs> We do have some time for questions and comments, so if any of you do have them, and I would assume such uh, talks would generate some interest, feel free to uh, use the microphones at either side of the building room. Yes. Thank you. First, may I say hello, Scott. I am Lem Harris. I haven't seen you for 40 years, and you look just like you looked 40 years ago, and I'm delighted. <laughs> Maybe a little better. Now, now I have a question. I know you have traveled very widely, and you mentioned having been in China. Would you give us a little notion of your observations of the intensive Chinese a uh, agriculture? Is the uh, life of a uh, person working a small acre, a small amount of land in China, uh, is it a drudgery life? Does it have uh, the qualities that uh, you have found yourself? I think we'd be all interested in a few comments on that. Yes, <coughs> I've been around a good deal. I've been in China several times. I've been in the Soviet Union nine times since the revolution. I've been around the world several times, <clears throat> and everywhere I've been interested and uh, paid attention to the problem of feeding the population. I'm not interested whether I'm feeding Frenchmen or Germans or Chinese or Hindus or what. I'm not interested in what we're feeding, in who we're feeding. I'm interested in the, the kind of nutrition that we're passing out. And uh, uh, the, Chinese. the Chinese, there are about 980 million of them. We have about 200, 217 million in the United States. They have about four times plus the population that we have. When I first went to China in 1927, people were dying on the streets. Every year, somewhere in China, there was famine. People were in rags. Unemployment was ripe. Beggary was general. The last time I was in China, well, just concretely, <clears throat> when I was in China in 27, the first time, I went to the hospital in Shanghai and talked to the doctor, the doctor. One of them said, there are 25,000 cases of cholera in Shanghai today, July. 25,000 20, cases of, of cholera in China today. The last time I was in China, they, and the doctors in the same hospital told me, we do not have a record of a single case of cholera in China. Now, <clears throat> Lem Harris asked, whether there's a difference between a China as sanitary as that, cleaned up, and China as healthy as that, where people provide health 
instead of medicine. In this country, when you get sick, you go where all the other sick people go, to the hospital. And the druggists sell you medicines at up to a thousand percent profit as a means of keeping you sick and keeping themselves in the luxuries of life. <laughs> the Chinese have got beyond that. And if you go there today, and I hope you all will go to China, I hope you all have the means of getting there and don't go all at once, but... <laughs> <laughs> I hope you go to China and see well, what, what do I see? The last time I came back to the United States, I came into Boston from abroad. I came into Boston. It was the dirtiest damn town I had been in since I left the United States. Dirty, disheveled, disorganized, a, a sloppy place. And the, 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 the Shanghai that I left in 1927 as a terrible mess was so well organized and so clean that you could eat off the street, the street or the sidewalk without any fear. 1970. And this is the last time I was there. The, the thing had been cleaned up and the, the, the cleaning up process has been done within the last quarter century, or a little more. Now, the people in China are potentially healthy, given a chance. The people in the United States are potentially healthy, given a chance. You don't need a half a million dollars to keep you healthy. What you need is good, clean, fresh, Good, clean, fresh food, not good, stale food. And if you eat stale food out of the supermarkets, of course you'll be sick. <laughs> what other result would you expect? <laughs> what was that? Uh, you happen to be at the table with two other people who were to China recently. <laughs> <laughs> good. And I am a little distressed by China, not by what I saw, which you s described amply. I think it's correct, and I disagree with nothing. But I'm distressed that they are adopting as fast as they can the very technology that I'm sitting here writing papers to scotch. Uh, I, we went to China with Charlie and my wife in uh, 76, and we went to look at the children and I found one cases of acne. And we went through school after school after school. As far as our diet is concerned, they flunk. If they're in a corn area, they eat corn, basically corn. If they're in a rice area, they eat basically rice. Very little meat, but they do have fresh fruits and vegetables, and I feel that's the key. And they were healthy. Except they were having them make DDT in the high school, immerse themselves in the chemicals, handle them rather dangerously, and the physician in uh, Shanghai told me that the cancer profile was becoming a problem. So I wish that we could learn from China what they learned and quit se sending them our mistakes. <laughs> Gentlemen over there, please. Yeah, I have a question for Mr. Walters. Uh, I'm a very small Iowa farmer, truck farmer, actually. And uh, I have occasion to come to a lot of the conferences that are put on by the horticultural department here at, uh, at Ames. And uh, while I, I, I began to notice uh, that there's a slight change in the, in the uh, presentations, you know, in the last year especially, we've just started to begin to see a change. We, 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 they're coming up with new acronyms like integrated pest management and things like this that are uh, old, old familiar things. But I'm wondering if you uh, 
well, I, I suppose it's, it, it's uh, kind of foolish to expect an apology for the work that the land-grant colleges have done for the last 35 years in the promotion of um, large-scale, uh, heavily mechanized and heavily uh, uh, heavy chemical farming. I wonder if you've noticed that change, too, and if you expect it to uh, uh, grow or if this is, if you expect some, some, something good to come out of the land-grant colleges now. I, th I think there is a change coming about. It's very slow. You are not going to get an apology from anyone for anything they've done uh, over the last 30 years. But that isn't in the cards. If we're sitting here waiting to get credit, then we will probably wait in vain because whoever finally adopts everything that's been done and said in the last 10 years will have to pass that off as his own, you see. And I'm here to pass it off as somebody else's to start with because, frankly, it came out of these schools. What happened was, at the end of World War II, you had oil being pumped into a tanker at a, at a 6.2 cents a barrel in Saudi Arabia and Iran. And this whole technology, this whole bag of tricks that agriculture adopted, is geared to that barrel of oil and has been sold ever since then. Uh, the late Dr. Albrecht told me how he was drummed out of the University of Missouri because he wouldn't go along. The technology was coming along beautifully by the end of World War II along the lines we're talking about and suddenly it was chopped off just like that. And all the research from that point was basically pointed into the direction of fossil fuel technology. Well, fossil fuels are faltering now. And when they falter, the fossil fuel technology will also falter. And that's why you're going to see this little changeover, slow but sure. You'll see more tech, you'll see people who were literally outlaws in the field, like Dr. Sen at Clemson University. They will be invited to the seminars and so on more and more as time goes on. So uh, I think your observation is quite correct. Are there any other questions or comments from the audience? Yes. Um, Helen and Scott Nearing, do you live in the United States just because this is where you started out, or did you make a decision to stay here, and if so, why? Did you decide to stay here in the United States, or did you leave? Could you have left? In, uh, in the uh, <coughs> art gallery in London, there is a picture of Herculaneum and Pompeii. Uh, there is a picture of Herculaneum and Pompeii being covered with cinders and flaming sh shards from the volcano. And uh, 